members include the UAF Alaska Sea Grant Extension Office, the Cordova Chapter of the Prince William Sound Audubon Society, who hosts one lecture a month, and the United States Forest Service, who generously donates the space and equipment. My name is Meadow Scott. I work for the Science Center organizing the lecture series and help with other ed educational programming. So if you have any ideas for the lecture series, lecturers, or subjects you'd like to see covered, um, please let me know. We run Tuesday night lectures from September through April. Next week's lecturer will be Dr. Deborah Cherry, who will be sharing results from the 2015 Commercial Fishing Health Survey. There's a sign-in sheet going around. I'm going to pass it as soon as I get back there. Uh, if you haven't already, please put your name down so we can keep track of how many people attend and keep putting on this great event. If you do not already receive our email flyers and you'd like to, then you can go ahead and put your email address. But if you already receive our flyers, you don't need to. Okay, now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Paul Krejci. 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 <laughs> oh yeah, like Krejci. Krejci. <laughs> Paul has a PhD in music and anthropology, and he teaches music at UAF. He's also a maritime adventurer and has sailed with Bob Bernard and RJ Kopchak, as well as participating in a national historic sailing voyage as crew aboard the Charles W. Morgan, the last surviving 18th century whaling vessel. Something I hope he tells us a little bit about. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming forward to sharing with you my research on music. And we all maybe have a sense of the history in Alaska, but not always a sense of music. What was going on musically? We'll hopefully learn is that music played a very important role in how people of different cultures, for one thing, people spoke a different language, communicated with one another, especially initially. So I'll kind of look at the waves of these different populations, foreign populations that came to Alaska, particularly in the party and um, how music played a key role in setting up relations that led to trade and, and other things. Here we have a picture of uh, Bob's great uncle, Joe Bernard, a picture that he took back in 1911. So we'll talk about this a little bit later in the talk. OK, the uses of music. All right, we can always point out certain things that are a little obvious, can provide pleasure, you can while away monotony, you can act as a mental diversion, and promote work efficiently. And we'll see that especially in terms of the whaling music. It creates teamwork, solidarity, and also serves an outlet for venting. There are more spiritual sort of components, I think, to music as well. It can raise our morale, lift our spirits, allows us to communicate you know, with people who don't share a common language. And what we'll see is that it helps induce trade um, in the Western Arctic region in terms of uh, religion. It maintains rituals, inspires a higher purpose. These are all kind of positive uh, traits that we associate with music. You'll see that you know music also can distract, and you'll find that um, on whale ships there was only a certain time that particular music was allowed. Um, it could be annoying, right? Yeah. <laughs> Those of you who have, uh, of course, teenagers, you don't necessarily connect with them musically. You know, it's something that builds walls, okay? builds walls between generations, and builds walls between cultures as well. So, get a sense of the geography here. We're going to focus, of course, on the north, and particularly the western Arctic, encompassing area around northern Alaska, northwestern Canada, also Chukotka Peninsula. So, when I did my uh, research, uh, I did my dissertation, what I was interested in was seeing how music was used then as a, as a way for people to communicate with one another. And so I looked at some of the early uh, explorers who entered the Western Arctic region. We all heard of Captain James Cook in 1784, one of the earliest of the Western explorers who went up into the Bering Strait region. 
Um, some of his crew members made remarks about the indigenous peoples and how they interacted with them musically. See here a quote. They drew up abreast of each other under our stern and gave us a song while one of their number beat upon a kind of drum and another made a thousand antic motions with his hands and body. Notice that these people who approached you know, the, the ship. So this wasn't a case where, on land where people were uh, communicating with another, but it was done on the vessels themselves. 50 years later, we have a quote then by Captain Beachy, who was uh, up near the Kotzebue, north of the Kotzebue area, northwestern Alaska. And this is a case then, by this time, there was um, a culture contact which was much stronger than it had been decades earlier. And a comment here is made, the whole village then assembled better dressed than they had been on their first visit and ranged themselves in a semicircle in front of us preparatory to an exhibition of one of their dances. When the dance was over, they presented us with dried salmon, and each person brought his bag of goods and produced a brisk order with great fairness on all sides. You see that music and dance, the way kind of break the ice and allow them to with better relations to ensue, and we can develop them also better opportunity for trade on both sides to emerge. Some of the instruments, you know, that were brought on board. Uh, Perry, you know, by part of exploration, he was a famous English explorer who was exploring the eastern part of the Arctic, um, looking for the Northwest Passage back in the early 19th century. He was an explorer who really saw the importance of having music um, uh, on board ships and as a way to raise morale and build teamwork. And this is an interesting instrument that was brought on board back in 1810, 200 years ago, uh, the barrel organ. And think of it, it's kind of a music jukebox you know, that was available already as long as it goes 200 years. And we can maybe hear an uh, example of one of the pieces that they would have heard 200 years ago. instruments that they brought on board as well. Um, not quite accordions, but uh, a couple decades later, accordions were available. They had fiddles, they had fifes, they had drums. So live music, of course, was, was alive and well uh, during this time period. But we also see examples already of pre-recorded music. So after the explorers, you know, begin to ex you know, settle um, coastline of the Western Arctic, we also begin to see an influx of, of whalers. There are up to 2,700 you know, whale ships that entered the Western Arctic between the years 1848 or so and <coughs> part of the 20th century. And as part of my research, I went to the various uh, whaling museums, New Bedford Whaling Museum, in Massachusetts was an important one. And I was, went through a whole bunch of these journals, almost losing my eyesight, and trying to locate you know, any sort of reference to music. There wasn't much of it. You know, the whalers had other things on their minds. But every now and then, you would come across a musical gem. And this is one that I found, the Eliza Adams in 1852. It's one of the first of these uh, whale ships entering the Western Arctic. And here we have a wonderful description of the music that's being heard on board. So the top left, went forward tonight to hear some music, found the fiddler playing the 4th of July, Evans keeping time with the bones, 
the blacksmith playing Juber on the banjo, Goss was playing Bonaparte crossing the Alps on the fife, and Kimball was whistling Yankee Doodle Doo. The Portuguese, which are probably Cape Verde Islanders, uh, was singing a song of their own, and some of the rest was singing Old Dan Tucker has come to town, came aft as far as the steerage, found the fiddle there, an accordion in full blast. One singing when I can read my little dear, another old Miss Lucy Neal. Then went into the cabin and found the old man rattling away at the cinderstoke, the rest trying very hard to go to sleep. Then lay down on the chest, thought of the girl I left behind me, fell asleep and dreamt of thunder. <laughs> A wonderful quote. And what we see here is that whaling crews were multicultural. Um, they were made up of people European Americans, African Americans, <coughs> Europeans, Africans, uh, Asians, uh, people from Australia, and of course indigenous peoples, you know, from out you know, Pacific Islanders, for example, and from the Western part of itself. Each of them sharing their music. Quite often, you know, not perhaps even understanding each other um, language-wise, but being able to communicate uh, via music. Another quote that I was able to find, um, there was a theory that there was really much music that was done during the summer months on these whale ships because they were busy, you know, finding the whales. But I did find a quote here that uh, would disprove it. We have an example here from the Hannibal, of July 29th, 1850. So we saw a whale in the morning, two mates lowered, no chance, cooled down the tri works. And several canoes came off during the day, afternoon spoke ship. Superior 2600 whale and ship Cincinnati and had a fine gam with both. Barred the cat's fiddle and goldsmith played, and all hands had a dance on deck. This is during the summer months, you know, when they should have been out working hard. And right now they found time then to enjoy themselves, entertain one another. And it's very likely that uh, native peoples would have witnessed this. You know, if you had um, families that would join the whalers. The women would work as seamstresses. Um, and men would help with the hunting. And there'd be children on board observing this music. And it would come natural to them. They would learn this music at a very young age. So the ship, the, really the only one of its kind still in existence from this time period, the mid-19th century, is the famous Charles W. Morgan, which was built in 1841. And uh, 2014, they took the ship out and traveled then part of the eastern seaboard from New London. Actually, it's a mystic seaport, but we started then from New London. And then the ship continued and made stops along the way to New Bedford, Cape Cod Canal, made out of the province town, and then to Boston. And then it made its way back then over period of about two months. And I was one of um, about a group of about 80 scholars or so, artists, who were able to participate on one of these legs. So that's what I did. I did the first leg then from New London to, to Newport. And extraordinary experience just to be able to, you know, not be on this ship that had survived, you know, the Arctic, had survived, you know, gales all around the world and is still with us today, fortunately. So I was give a better sense then of um, the work that was involved with these whale ships, but also be more keenly aware of the music um, that was there to assist much of this work. Play a little bit, there's a video here uh, where I shared songs that were aboard these whaling ships, known as shanties. They also had sea songs as well that may not have actually had a, um, a role to play as far as company work. The origins of these shanties, West African, Caribbean, also English, Scottish, Irish. And the main features that we hear, you know, in the shanties, it makes use of a call and response, something that we find in a number of 
um, African-inspired styles of music, think of the blues, and the jazz. We find it also in these shanties as well. Also, we find that it takes a, a narrative form. There's a story that is told. Quite often, there'd be these grueling tasks that these whalers had to engage in that would last hours on end, and the person, quite often, of one person would be singing the shanties, would have to make a story out of it and give the workers inspiration to toil away for at least an hour or more. Improvisation also is very important. You had to bend, you know, to the changing circumstances, perhaps weather conditions or what had to be done that was unplanned on the ship. So a person singing the shanties would have to improvise on the spot as well. Now the types of shanties that we have, it's really you can categorize them into, into three uh, groups. Those that involve hauling, right, which is the pulling motion, which involve uh, pulling with rope, will raise a sail. So we have different types of motions. We have a short drag or a long drag. We have examples of heaving, right? Where you gotta push. You gotta push uh, certain um, instruments like a cap stand, which we'll see pictures of, uh, and a windlass. So is it a pulling motion or a pushing motion? Those are the work songs. Then we also have foxhole songs. These are the songs that were for purely entertainment purposes. And we'll listen to an example of that as well. Why don't we sing one of these shanties? <laughs> Here we have an example of a long drag halyard shanty. So it involves, of course, pulling. And I'll be the shanty. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'll narrate my part, and what you're going to do is respond. So we have this call and response. So I'll say something, and then what you say in response is, John Kanakanaka to Laie. And then I'll say something again, and you respond again with John Kanakanaka to Laie, and then we'll all join together in the chorus. So this is how it goes. I thought I heard the old man say, John Kanakanak to lie. Today, today is a holiday. John Kanakanak to lie. Chorus. To lie. Oh, to lie. John Kanakanak to lie. To lie. Oh, to lie. John, Kanakanaka We'll work tomorrow, but not today. John, Kanakanaka to Laie. But we'll take home a full day's pay. John, Kanakanaka to Laie. To Laie, oh, to Laie. John, Kanakanaka to Laie. To lie, oh, to lie, John, connect, connect, get to lie. Fourth one, it's rotten meat and weevilly bread. John, connect, connect, get to lie. In two months out, you wish you were dead. John, connect, connect, get to lie. To lie, oh, to lie. John, can I connect to Laie? To Laie, oh, to Laie. John, can I connect to Laie? So far, the verse is very good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you need to know about whaling? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to know about whaling. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine there are the motions then that go along with this uh, chanting. And uh, there's a tendency to sing these probably a little bit too fast, maybe actually how they would have been done at the time. Probably would have been just a little bit slow. But uh, this is a wonderful a song, one of the most popular ones. A kanaka is, is it designates actually a Pacific Islander. Um, it's this 
quite often it, it referred to Hawaiian peoples, Samoan peoples. Um, so here's a wonderful example then of a shanty that is a long drag alley. Publishing. So here we have pictures you can see whalers doing their they're in their pulling. They're dragging, long dragging. So the one we just sang is a long drag halyard on the right. You can listen to probably the one most famous, if not the most famous of the shanty, the drunken sailor. And if you could play meadow that that piece. The one on the right. <coughs> What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? Her lying come morning. Hey, oh, up she rises. Hey, oh, up she rises. Hey, oh, up she rises. Her lying come morning. Shave his face with a rusty razor. Shave his face with a rusty razor. Shave his face with a rusty razor. Her lying come morning. So, a bit faster, and it goes probably a little bit too fast for the type of work that was involved, and it's become faster and faster as a popular song, so to speak. But here it does have a little bit faster pace to it, so that's who it would be compared to that long drag halyard. You may notice that Drunk Sailor not only works as a short drag, uh, shanty can also work as a capstan uh, shanty. And this is the instrument that we see on the top right. Okay. So this is a winch, essentially, um, that would be needed to um, raise really heavy loads. For example, an anchor, which can weigh tons. Especially, you can imagine if you're on a naval ship, two, three hundred sailors, some of the anchors that would be needed. Um, of course, sometimes the entire crew would be needed in order to raise that anchor. We find this among the smaller whaling ships as well. Notice at the bottom, this is a picture, then we have a person playing the fife. So this tells you that it was, it was a naval ship. And uh, on the naval ships, in order to maintain discipline, they didn't want people to sing shanties. Because under the shanty, then it would allow people to uh, improvise. And so to speak, and maybe start to say things that would break, break the discipline, right? So instead, they refer to them instrumental music. So they have a fight there. On the merchant ships, however, whaling ships, of course, Shanty City was encouraged. Let's listen to the one at the bottom. You probably heard of Shenandoah. Did you realize it was actually originally a shanty? Let's listen then to this beautiful tune. Santiano. So this is a shanty accompanying windless operation. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes, of course, if they had to survive a winter up there, long then for the climbs of the, of the south. So this is a song about heading back to Hawaii. What I'll do is use my accordion to accompany us. So if, on these foxhole songs, it was normal then to use an instrument. Notice for these shanties that I presented to you, they're all just sung at the pelvis, no instrument involved. Instruments were used, though, quite often then for these foxhole type of songs that were created. So, here we have then got the verse, and then we got the chorus, you know, on the right. And you probably catch on to the melody, one that you probably have heard. I'm more of a keyboardist than a guardian, so pardon me. But Oh, 
We've got a number more of the verses, but maybe another time. Thank you. Sing them all. So, as Alaskans, we can definitely connect to this song. Mm -hmm. So, these type of songs that often you heard in the folk song, um, it could have been newly created melodies, but often they were just popular melodies. Melodies in the mid-19th century, of course, one of the most famous composers is Stephen Foster. And we'll listen to a few pieces of his. But what we'll find is that these sort of songs that were um, introduced into the native peoples. Here is a wonderful quote and from John Murdoch, who was a scientist up in Barrow in the 1880s. And he makes a remark about the type of songs that were introduced to the Nubia people, so uh -huh. Barrow. We found Shoe Fly, Little Brown Jug, great favorites at the time of our arrival. One old woman from Nubuk, Barrow, told us with great glee how Magua McGuire, that was a famous English explorer from around the 1850s, used to sing Told the Road the Roll. Our two violins, the doctors and the cooks, were a constant source of delight to them. You can listen to an example of Shoe Fly, please. Ah, uh, the one on the left, top left. And the next one, then. Little Brown Jug, famous too. Popular songs I've introduced. Often they came from the minstrel uh, repertoire. And as I mentioned before, Stephen Foster wrote, you know, a number of, of course, these big hits, Camp Town Races, most of them, old folks at home. Quite often, what the whalers did, they took the tunes and then they changed the lyrics. Um, Camp Town Races, they became Banks of the Sacramento. Oh, Susanna, they, they might come from Salem City, old folks at home, and wild and ugly, referring to the whale. Of course, patriotic songs um, were popular as well. Battle of the Republican Dixie. So, as the whalers uh, proceeded northward, um, <coughs> then they ventured eastward across northern Alaska, and there was talk about uh, this ground of whaler of whalers <coughs> that had been untapped, and they were in this Beaufort Sea region. The problem was, of course, getting there. Um, avoiding then, of course, the, uh, the ice. But they realized that there was this one important island called Herschel Island, one of the few places along the northern coastline where these larger whale ships could winter. So the key was then to overwinter, which would give them, the whalers, a little bit more time then to do their whaling activities once that ice then begins to melt by June, July. So instead of having to start again from San Francisco, you know, in the early summer, these whalers were already there in the Beaufort Sea Grounds. So Herschel Island, around the 1890s, early 1900s, had upwards of 1,000 people living on this island. There's a beautiful picture that we see here in the top right. Um, we have the seven whale ships that overwintered. We find here quotes of, particularly of Hawaiian uh, musicians, quite often playing minstrel music. We see examples of the popular music being introduced to the people um, of Herschel Island. We have this interesting term called the hula hula. And this is a term that I found here quite often around the late 1800s, early 1900s, referring to Eskimo dancing. And what it often meant it was a sort of a combination of a popular song synthesized with that of the traditional native dance. And here we quote that 
refers to that. They have theatrical performances, you see in the picture on the right. Grand old opera being presented. And there's some various whalers. And you see um, at least one of the whalers looks like he may be Cape Verde Islander. <coughs> Some of these whalers then, once the whaling began to decline in the region, they turned to trade. And two of the most important ones, Hartson Botfish and Christian Peterson, who uh, began to trade and do extensive trading all the way around Alaska, Western Alaska, Northern Alaska, into Canada. These are some of the uh, materials that eventually would be used then to construct uh, musical instruments from. Notice we have needles, the old time phonograph needles, made out of ivory. And then of course the whalers themselves engaged in scrimshaw. Quite often you find images of, of musical instruments engraved in the ivory. Photographs. Okay, you start to see being a very important trade item. So my research, what I did, I, I, I analyzed them the, the type of goods that were brought up, trading goods, particularly musical instruments. And notice accordions, um, at least in the early years, in the early 1900s, were fairly common trade item. Harmonicas, which of course were much cheaper. Um, were very popular, and of course records. Now, so these are, most of these items would have been traded in with the indigenous peoples all throughout the Western part. Of it. So notice we look at this chart, you know, it's a pretty good number of um, musical instruments, but then we start to see a, a decline. Fewer accordions, still harmonicas, just not cheap enough, very few violins, but we start to see gramophones, of course records. So live music is starting to re start to be replaced then by pre-recorded music. Of course, this is a problem that we are concerned with today, right? There's not enough live music to be heard. Um, so we see this trend already beginning you know, in a remote area like the Western area in the early 20th century. Here, by the 1930s, very few, just a couple of accordions with food sold and bartered away. A tremendous number of gramophones. Gramophones served as a status symbol, you know, for indigenous people, not just a, just as a source of entertainment. Now, of course, we have Joe Bernard, very important member of Cordova, who went up into the Canadian Arctic, uh, 1909, 1920, and this is a picture that he took. 1911, where we made contact with the proper Inuit peoples. And a uh, wonderful picture then of the, of the actual gramophone that he brought up. And uh, presenting it as a sort of technological curiosity. This was something that was done often by explorers, traders, when they made contact with indigenous peoples. And, uh, I mean, the instrument itself was already a, a source of curiosity, no matter what ethnicity you were from. But um, we find then that when Joe was up there, he used it often then as a way to break the ice and promote and trade with the native peoples. We find that this musical that fusion of uh, Western instruments, Western music, being <coughs> introduced into the central Canadian Arctic. Uh, by way of these traders, which I've mentioned before, Bachfish and Peterson. And you see pictures here, Honer Accordion, 1930s, and Kulu Took, which is a uh, former uh, copper mine. One last way that people discuss them before I conclude uh, this presentation is uh, the presence of missionaries. Um, so I did some research on uh, the Anglican Church, which is up in northwestern part of Canada, um, in the Pearson, Anubic region. And here I found a, a very interesting picture then of the 
hymns that are being introduced, you know, the native people, and what we have here is a concertina being used as a substitute for an organ. We find many examples of, of missionaries having these portable instruments, such as a concertina, which was such a durable instrument that withstood the cold much better than other instruments. And it was a portable instrument. You could then play Celebration, talents, and music. I've noticed that the successful missionary invariably capitalizes on the, this excellent trait in the Eskimo character. Of course, you consider this a colorful, maybe romanticization you know, of, of indigenous people. But you just see there's a, there was this um, interest you know, in, in, in the music that was being introduced. And of course, I was really well aware of some of the dangers of Eskimo dancing. It's not as a pagan. Sort of activity. And Bryce, who was a well known missionary up in Barrow, um, wrote this uh, alarming, I would say, uh, reference into the, how music and something, excuse me, dance was something that would have to be stamped out. We committed a change of figures in their hands. <laughs> Here are early pictures that we find in uh, Eskimo women playing a harmonium in Mary's igloo. Quite often there's um, females, young women, girls who learn to play uh, the organ, the piano, or the, or, or the harmonium. And then you see examples of the hymns that are early on, and then translations that from English into a new piano or other indigenous languages. And you see that depending on the tolerance of the, of the religion or the particular missionary, you see the state of, of traditional music it, it varies you know, across Alaska. Um, you find in Katovic, and this is a picture that I was up in uh, two years ago with Bob and RJ. Um, Katovic, of course, located in the northeastern part of Alaska. There, the, the, the traditional music is... is it's a very healthy state. You can say with, there was less exposure into Western um, influence, and the missionaries tend to be a, a bit more tolerant of the dance. Um, but we still see these right, revitaliz revitalization efforts. And the key is try to have the children learn it at a very young age. And this was one of the uh, highlights, I think, of the trip. I think Bob would agree with me when we stayed in Katovic, the very friendly community, as we tried to make their second attempt to the eastern Arctic. But we were, of course, stopped by ice. But we met a very friendly community who took care of us. And uh, we got a chance then to introduce ourselves and talk about you know, the reason that we were up there. And uh, we were given that, uh, a dance uh, by, the, by the children of the community. And if you could just play a bit of this. Surely a number of these drummers start to leave the ensemble. Because <laughs> they're so excited if you want to get out to the water. So this is a treat 
for me, studying the music of Alaska Natives. Quite often, the only option I have is at the Festival of Native Arts. It's presented over here, and it's done in a more natural setting in the village itself. So we, uh, I was witness them to actually perform and practice. see the young girl then watching the booze of the older one. So we see then various waves, right? The, these foreign populations starting with explorers, then whalers, then traders, and missionaries, and starting from late 1700s. And I did my research into the early 20th century. And here, of course, we see footage then the revitalization of, of native drum dancing in various locations around Alaska. Um, so I hope you get a better sense of the importance of, of music, you know, in the Western Arctic. And uh, what music means to you personally, but also means to you as a culture, you know, and, and think about how music is, is so often used as a, as a way to, to bring people together, you know, and I think uh, hopefully I've been able to show you some of these examples historically in the backyard of Alaska. You know. So I thank you very much for your attention, and if you have some questions, I can take a few of them. And uh, yeah, we are on the way, so thank you. <laughs> Good old Gary Larson. <laughs> Paul, is the Hula Hula River named after yes. this dance? It is. Conglomeration? Really? Yeah, there's a Hula Hula River close to Kato. Yeah, and it was named around the same time. So it shows I me mean, the importance of yeah, the music and the dance. But then this was and there and there's there are references to um, cross cultural exchange, not only by you know Nubiak and uh, European American mothers, but Pacific Islanders, Hawaiians in particular. And we do see the, the common. Um, Dance motions, you know, the motions that have a meaning attached to them. And we find that's quite interesting as we have that in the indigenous peoples around Hawaii, but also among the Nubiak and the Nubian peoples. Perhaps, shall I have some, you know, millennia ago, the closest sort of connection in these peoples. Music, of course, dancing service, ethno historical record. I so want about further into the interior. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was in Old Crow many years ago. Yeah. And they, they, we, they had a dance for us, and um, in in an old, in their community hall, the floor was polished by, from them all doing the jig. Mm -hmm. But when the music started, it never stopped until midnight. On Saturday night, because they have blue laws or something. Okay, okay anyway, okay. they would just people would just trade off instruments, but the music never stopped. Never stopped. No, yeah. 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 And of course, that's interesting. I mean, I did my research in the Kennedy Delta. You go to Old Crow, but uh, why I went there is because you see such a diversity right. of musical styles and music cultural contact. Um, whalers, but then the indigenous peoples of Alaska, the Aleut, also Nubiak, center of the area. Um, so you have this wonderful mixture of the culture. And um, this jig music, yeah, some of that is derived from the, from the whales in the late 1800s. That, and that was part of my research. I mean, what I mean, sparked my interest in this research was one day, about 15 years ago, I saw this image of a Canadian Inuit woman with a button box recording. And it's just so intriguing. It says, why? Why would they have a button box? And all right, then I learned more about the importance of the whalers. And then I was interested in the Western Arctic, because that was in the Eastern Arctic. We see these important traditions that have set root you know, among many Canadian Inuit peoples. The same sort of conditions, I think, existed here in the Western Arctic. We had accordions that were introduced, um, quite a number of them. But there was no tradition that was established, you know, not as firmly as it was in the Eastern Arctic. You can see maybe vestiges of it, maybe in the dances. You know. 
that work. It would have been kind of thinking about accordion. But what I was trying to do with Mackenzie Delvo was find some accordion players. And I, I found one, and he was actually the grandson of uh, uh, Thrasher is his name, which is named after a whale ship called Thrasher. So his, so his grandfather was a uh, native who was working on, the, on this ship. And then he received the name Thrasher. But, um, but yeah, he, and that was one of the other side projects I wanted to do when I was up in the Arctic. You know, with Bob and RJ was trying to make it to Banks Land, Banks Island, because I understand there, there was perhaps still some of this whaling tradition, um, music-wise, you know, still extent, you know, in the early arts. But unfortunately, we couldn't make it up there. But um, you find perhaps some of these sort of vestiges of the music still around. It takes, it's, you have to look hard, I think, for it. And I think it must still be around. Any, any other questions? In your research, did you um, have an opportunity to find out how the Native peoples were really treated? Because in some of the old whaling adventures, Natives were very much mistreated. Oh, yes. Alcohol, of course, was introduced in you know, the way of the way. Um, yeah, many dark moments, you could say. Um, I kind of look at it in terms of music, and of course, the music has a double edged sword, because there's, it's interesting, there was this concern um, by missionaries, but also by Native peoples, elders, about music and its association with dance, especially Western dancing, and how that would create conditions then for perhaps a whaler. To you know, make contact, physical contact, and like that, with a young native woman you know, or a girl. You know. So we have these, these darker sort of um, stories you know, associated with the music. So that is the thing, yeah. How music is is it, it's, it's, it goes both ways. Um, yeah, it's important to point that out. Um, but at least we kind of see. Something like music is all around us. That's why we don't really realize, you know, how important it is. It's part of our culture, part of who we are as human beings. And especially if you're a musician, I think you're more aware of this. But if you're not, still, you you listen to music all the time, right? It's all around us. You know? And there's there are messages that are in the music. You know? um, so I hope to continue with, with this research, and I'm interested in. Of course, the interior of Alaska, where we have this, uh, the Baskin fiddling, and of course, and, and some musical set is and all that, right? So, uh, I'd like to continue to do this and, and, and get a better sense then of what role that music played. Then. Anything else? Huh? Yes. Uh, no Russian influence, no musical instrument? Or there is, you know. So look, it's interesting, we talk about the accordion, you know, and accordion, it seems to be this dearth or this hole in Alaska. Well, of course there were accordions introduced, but there was just really no tradition established. But we see it in, the, in Canada, we see uh, accordion tradition established, and of course we see it in Russia as well, uh, in, among indigenous peoples. There are accordions that are being played by, by native peoples there. And, but we don't really find it so much here. We, there are examples of it, I think, um, Yupik peoples. Actually, um, there are some women in you know, the Bethel area, in some of the villages around Bethel, who play an accordion. And it's usually um, accompanies a hymn singing. It's for the church services. Uh, but again, I see that accordion was acted as a substitute for a piano or organ. But there is a bit of Russian influence, um, I think, among those regions, it's the western part of Alaska, and the southwestern part. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. What power of Perry's organ? Was it Pansy Pump Air? Perry's organ? Uh, what was the power? I mean, it, obviously there's pipes, right? Right. So somebody had, Someone had to probably do it. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Another work, another <laughs> task involved, right? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, appreciate your presence and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And if you have any other questions, I'll talk to you then individually. Thank you very much. I'll be here for the next few days.